Good to see you, Congresswoman. Thank you, thank you. Good to be with you. Uh, we have literally been talking to you through every step of this process, including uh, shortly after the time when George Floyd was killed. Uh, and you've been very clear that the House did its work. But what happened in the Senate? What was the big breakdown over? Because when we've talked before, there were a lot of times where you sounded very optimistic. What was the main yes. sticking point? Well, you know what? Unfortunately, there wasn't a main sticking point. Let me be very clear. It was not overqualified immunity. It really wasn't. I think the biggest problem was Senator Booker just couldn't get Senator Scott to yes. He even went so far as to say, why don't we take Trump's executive order that all of the police support it? Why don't we take the executive order and put that into law? Because you know an executive order is not law and one administration can eliminate it. The Biden administration has continued the Trump executive order, and Senator Scott unfortunately couldn't even agree to that. Now, I will tell you that in the Los Angeles area, the Los Angeles Police Department, the Police Protective League, actually was supporting the reform process, but some of the national organizations disagreed and Senator Scott would never get to yes. And I think that Senator Booker basically just said, this is going on and on and on, and we can't get anywhere. So Senator Booker and I are calling on the administration to act, to call for a new executive order, to use the power of the administration to move the needle because we couldn't get the Senate to move. And thank you for acknowledging the House did its job. Hmm. Well, uh, the White House uh, press secretary uh, apparently listening to you. Uh, she issued a statement today, and in part, she said that the president is disappointed. She promised that in the coming weeks, the White House would engage with key groups to discuss, quote, a path forward. So simply put, that just means executive action and for the president to override everything that wasn't able to be accomplished. Right. And, and actually, you know, again, when Trump did his executive order, it was at the height of the movement to reform. And so some of the things that he did, you know, the Biden administration has kept. But chokeholds, banning chokeholds, no knock warrants, accreditation, so that we raise the standard of policing. You know, you always hear me say, we have tens of thousands of police departments and tens of thousands of different ways for policing to take place in the United States. Transparency accountability. We want to stop seeing people die at the hands of the police. One of the things that we were adding into the bill this time that unfortunately we didn't get to was hundreds of millions of dollars to health and human services for mental health responders. So there would be co-responders because, you know, a number of people who die at the hands of police are actually experiencing a mental health crisis. So we weren't even able to get to that. It's a sad day. So how much of that can get done via executive action? What are we looking at happening now? Well, first of all, the administration has already moved. I think a couple of weeks ago, they got frustrated with us. And so they issued new guidelines to the Department of Justice on the federal level to address chokeholds, to address no-knock warrants. So there's more that the federal government can do. But once again, you can put it in place and a new administration can Right. And we hope that that you know, does not happen. Let, let me ask a, a bigger follow-up question just about the concept of bipartisanship. Because you sure. came on here several times, talked about Thank Senator you. Scott, said he was negotiating in good faith, felt like yes. you were building a relationship on trust. Right. Is bipartisanship dead? Is it possible to actually do a bipartisan bill right now? Is there an incentive structure for Republicans to work with Democrats? Well, I think it is. It depends on the issue. I frankly, in all honesty, believe that it took too long and that momentum actually reversed. You know that crime goes in cycles. Crime dips, crime increases. And once people started coming outside when we thought we were getting past the pandemic, that's when you saw an increase in crime. And I think that in the last election, my Republican colleagues brilliantly waged a campaign all around the country, accusing Democrats of supporting defunding the police and saying that essentially the reason why crime was ticking up was because of police reform. We were tying the hands of police. 
We were demoralizing police, and that's why crime was ticking up. And when that momentum took hold, again, it didn't necessarily so much in, in our state, but in other states it did, mm. well, then that took away the incentive for reforms. I think we missed our moment, to be honest with you. What's your message to the George Floyd family? Oh, my message to the George Floyd family is, it, please accept my apologies. I do have to tell you that if the senators had moved forward with the level of compromising that they had talked about, we would not have put George Floyd's name on the bill because it was nothing, it was gonna be nothing like the bill that passed out of the House. And I don't think that it would have afforded the respect that we thought the family deserved. Wow, a lot of candor there uh, from you, Congresswoman. Uh, let's talk about another issue because when people see you, they're gonna be expecting us to ask about this. Uh, there's the race for LA mayor. Last night here at seven o'clock, we had Kevin DeLeon uh, in our studio on the day that he announced that he is gonna be running for mayor. We know that Mike Fuhr, uh, the city attorney is also running. Jessica Lal uh, is running as well as Joe Buscaino, who is an L.A. City Council member. There's a graphic of their faces. And so the big question is, are you going to be joining them? Recently, when you were on with us, you said that you were strongly considering it. Um, right. Any updates? <laughs> Want to break some news here? And, 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 and if not, is there a timeline on when there might be a decision? Sure. I'm sorry. I don't have any news to break for you today. <laughs> I have been completely absorbed today in policing the debt ceiling and the end of the fiscal year, but I am going to make a decision very, very soon. Well, Alex uh, interviewed the one and only Dolores Huerta today. Yeah, yeah this right? is for our political show. No. The issue is, uh, you know her pretty well. Um, and I so I asked her <laughs> about, um, about her role models. Here's what she said. No. Oh. And, you know, so many people count you as their role model. Who is your role model? Oh, my goodness. Um, I have so many. Karen Bass, uh, who, who I really uh, look up to a lot. Do you want Karen Bass to run for mayor of Los Angeles? Absolutely. Yes, I think she'll, she'll make a great mayor. Wow. <laughs> what do you make of that? Wow. Well, you talk about somebody that I have the utmost respect for. She's a Rosa Parks of our generation. Oh. I mean, she's an absolute icon. So that is an incredible compliment. And uh, I, I'm, I'm just, breath is taken away. Oh, that was a nice moment. <laughs> so are you gonna, so are you gonna let her down? Are you gonna run? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you one thing, I'm gonna give her a call. <laughs> well, you give us a call when you make that decision, when you're ready to announce uh. one way or the other, please. Congresswoman <laughs> Karis, Karen Bass, we appreciate it you joining us tonight. Great Thank to you. see you. I appreciate you guys.